So this is Catherine Lamprecht. I'm wearing two hats tonight. I'm with the Highland Park Historical Society and I'm with Chicago Foodways Roundtable. I have to think about this for a moment. So um, this program tonight uh, is sort of a replication of an event that um, Nicole Stalker, uh, Nancy Webster and I did as a panel for the uh, uh, Illinois History Symposium or conference at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And I have to tell you, I really liked doing a presentation at that location because, you know, I, I like Lincoln and I like the, the opportunity to have that uh, linkage. Um, but the real idea for this program tonight really was inspired by Nancy Webster. Um, she's the archivist for the Highland Park Historical Society, as well as for the uh, for the city of Highland Park. Uh, she'll tell you more her more formal title. But um, if it weren't for her, we would probably not be here tonight. But that's great. That's that's what I like. I like ideas. So our first presenter is going to be so Cole Stocker has worked as a museum educator with the Lake County Forest Preserves and the Best Bauer Dunn Museum of Lake County since 2008. She has a BA in history, a BA in anthropology, and a secondary education certificate from the University of Michigan, and a master's degree in public history from Loyola University of Chicago. And as part of her current role with the museum, she is in charge of interpretation of several historic sites with the Lake County Forest Preserves, including the Adley Stevenson Historic Home, Bonner Heritage Museum, I'm sorry, Bear, Bonner Heritage Farm, which is a historic farm that dates to the mid 1800s. And Fort Sheridan is also under her wing, which is not the focus of her talk today because, to, well, actually it's indirectly, it is about Fort Sheridan and it's a cookbook, a manuscript cookbook from somebody who once resided at Fort Sheridan. So Nicole, I'm turning it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and it's nice to be with everyone tonight and share this presentation again to a new audience. So, all right. Well, part of this conference was also informing um, other historians and museum staff about our experiences working with um, some of these documents. So, um, you know, during the past few years, museums and other institutions were all striving to reach our audiences in new ways. And as part of this, I worked with our collection staff at the Best Bauer Dunn Museum to research and interpret an item donated to, donated to us more recently in 2019. And this was done in part to take advantage of people's renewed interest in baking, if you recall that, and as part of an effort to create new virtual content to share on social media and reach our audiences. Um, so I took on a little bit of a new role at that point too um, with our marketing staff and digital engagement. So this was part of that as well with social media. So this handwritten cookbook that I'm gonna focus on tonight was made and used at Fort Sheridan. And the first page states, Mary Ethel Crofton, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, November, 1895. Now, Mary Ethel Crofton was the daughter of Gabrielle Josephine Schubert Crofton and Colonel Robert Erkstein Anderson Crofton, and he was Colonel 15th Infantry and Commander of Troops at Fort Sheridan from January of 1891 until October of 1896, and we'll talk more about him in a minute. Um, but today, 250 acres at Fort Sheridan are part of the Lake County Forest Preserves north of uh, you know, here and uh, part of the Best Bauer Dunn Museum is part of that as well. So the U.S. Army post at Fort Sheridan was in operation from 1887 until 1993. And when the fort closed, part of the land was donated to the Lake County Forest Preserves. And there was also a museum at the site, which also closed in 1993. And when it did, our staff worked to acquire a vast array of collections items, including dozens of artifacts and nearly 3,000 photographs and postcards. And since then, we have continued to expand the collection with new acquisitions, including those related to Fort Sheridan's history, like the Crofton cookbook. So here you can see some views of Fort Sheridan. 
and also some of the items on display at the Dunn Museum. So if you want to come check those out, we are open and I'll link in the chat in a minute um, our visiting hours currently. So Fort Sheridan began as a result of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. We just passed a significant anniversary for that. Mayor Roswell Mason declared martial law and General Philip Sheridan's troops with the Division of Missouri were brought in. And these troops built temporary shelters for victims of the fire and restored order. However, unrest continued in the city with labor strikes, including the railroad strike of 1877, which was a nationwide strike, and in particular, the Haymarket tragedy of 1886. And influential businessmen in Chicago who were members of a group called the Commercial Club feared the growing reality of a working class revolution in the city and discussed the possibility of the government establishing a military base near the city to permanently maintain order. Philip Sheridan was also a member of this club, and he, along with others, advised purchasing around 600 acres near Highwood, which was done. Lakefront property was and continues to be of high value around this area, but this particular spot was unappealing as it had been damaged. In the 1840s until approximately 1865, the village of St. John's was located at the site, just south of the historic district um, today. Members of the village would harvest clay deposited along the bluffs in the area and would make around 400,000 bricks annually. This work damaged the site, but this did not deter the army from being interested in it. Um, and here you can see the cliffs at Fort Sheridan uh, with a photograph view from around 1930 and a postcard view from around 1900. Well, Brigadier General Samuel B. Holliburd, Quartermaster General of the Army, awarded the commission for designing the fort to the firm of Holliburd and Roche, today Holliburd and Root. And if it sounds like I repeated myself, that's because that was his son's firm. So still pays to know people, right? Uh, the firm designed 66 buildings at the fort, including the iconic water tower, and these buildings were constructed between 1889 and 1895 out of an estimated 6 million bricks made on site out of clay mined from the bluffs. Holliburton and Roche worked with nationally recognized landscape architect Ocean C. Simons in the design and layout of the site. Simons was conservation minded and tried to preserve many of the natural elements, such as the ravines. He also chose the spot for the parade ground seen here and the layout of the buildings in a hollow square around the grounds, reflecting earlier fort designs. The first troops arrived in 1887 and camped in tents. The first cavalry troops arrived in 1892, and that included the 7th Cavalry. It was first called Camp at Highwood, but was given the name Fort Sheridan in 1888, and this was signed into existence by the Commander-in-Chief of the Army at the time, none other than Philip Sheridan himself. So he in part named Fort Sheridan after himself there. So Colonel Crofton's military career began during the American Civil War when he enlisted on May 14th of 1861. He then rose up the ranks gaining notoriety for his service, particularly during the battles of Shiloh, Chickamauga and Mission Ridge. After the war, he was stationed in the Western part of the United States and became Colonel on October 19th of 1886, commanding the 16th Infantry and Fort Buford, North Dakota until January 28th of 1891. He married Gabrielle Shubrick on January 7th of 1864, and Gabrielle stems from prominent French American relatives, including the founders of the DuPont Company. Together, they had six children, and sadly, the first child, Alice Moore, passed away very young at the age of one and a half. Later that same year, they had Julia DuPont, then Maud, followed by a son, William Moore, another daughter, Gabrielle Josephine, named for her mother, and lastly, Mary Ethel Crofton, who the cookbook relates to. So the family, um, Colonel Crofton, when he took command at Fort Sheridan, 
as the fourth post commandant in January of 1891, he would have lived with the family at 111 Logan Loop in building number nine, the post commandant's quarters. And here you can see a view of the officer's loop in 1890. And at the very end there, if you can see my cursor, that last house is the post commandant's right on Lake Michigan. So this building, as well as the building across from it on the loop, building nine and building eight, are right on Lake Michigan. And they were completed in 1890, just a year prior to the Crofton family's occupancy and designed in the Queen Anne style. This uh, was done by Holliburd and Roche to make sure that these two buildings stood apart from the rest of the homes in the officer's loop and the rest of the post which was designed in more of a version of Richardsonian Romanesque with very heavy brick and heavy rounded archways above windows and doorways. Um, all of the homes, but particularly these two Queen Anne style were considered unusually luxurious for military housing at the time. And I would say still today. Um, so here you can see some views of the post commandant's house and different sides of it, the back and the front. So Colonel Crofton was in charge at Fort Sheridan during the only test of the fort's true mission, which was to keep the peace in the city of Chicago. And that was when President Cleveland ordered troops into the city to establish law and order during the Pullman strike of May to July, 1894. Just after assuming command at the fort, he was also involved in another significant and complex chapter of the site's history. A group of 19 Sioux warriors had been brought to the fort after the battles of Wounded Knee in South Dakota in December of 1890. And some of the warriors did not return to South Dakota until summer of 1891. Many though ended up joining Buffalo Bill Cody on a tour through Europe. And here you can see a letter dated March 13th of 1891 from Major General Nelson A. Miles, commander of the Division of the Missouri, who had led the Sioux to the fort initially. And this was written to Colonel Crofton regarding Cody and allowing him the opportunity to speak with the native people at Fort Sheridan. He also states that they had permission from the army to join Cody, quote, granted they wanted to go. Um, troops from Fort Sheridan were again sent down to Chicago during the World's Fair of 1893, again connecting the Croftons to this area during an extremely significant time period. So tragically, Gabrielle Josephine Schubert Crofton passed away at the fort in December of 1894 of apoplexy or a cerebral hemorrhage or stroke. She was actually transported back to her hometown of Wilmington, Delaware by train and her funeral and burial took place there. Colonel Crofton appears to have taken a leave of absence from December of 1894 until April of 1895 as Colonel Samuel Ovenshine is listed as being in command during this period. With her death, their daughters, still stationed with their father at Fort Sheridan, would have taken on the role of hostess or hostesses of the post commandant's quarters for the remaining roughly year and a half, as again, Colonel Crofton served as post commandant until October of 1896. Mary Ethel Crofton then perhaps took on some of the duties with the kitchen with this cookbook. And perhaps it served as a way to remember and commemorate her mother. And I'll discuss this more later. Um, again, the first page that you can see here notes Mary Ethel Crofton, Fort Sheridan, November, 1895. And the cookbook is only about a fourth of the way filled and it contains mainly recipes for breads and desserts. Though there are a few exceptions to that as you can see here. Um, so these are all the recipes that are listed in there. Uh, I worked to photograph the cookbook at the museum and then transcribe it while working remote. And my intent again was to create more virtual content for audiences. So the highlighted ones we'll come back to, but those are the recipes that have been tried <laughs> so far. So still ways to go through the cookbook, even if it is a fourth of the way filled. Um, many of the recipes are actually credited to individuals and to forts. And though the last four are actually credited to the Washington Post and they all involve apples, the last four. 
Um, I listed out all the recipes in Mary's cookbook first and then decided to start with one that appeared somewhat familiar, soft ginger cookies. Years ago, I actually found my great grandmother's recipe for molasses cookies and have been making those every holiday season since. And the ingredients and instructions between the two were similar enough that my great grandmother's recipe actually helped to fill in gaps in Mary's recipe, baking time and temperature, estimated amount of flour, et cetera. Um, Cause as you can imagine, she did not have the, the same type of oven we have today for temperatures and times. And all she says for flour is add flour enough to make a light dough. So, you know, going off of that, you judge what the light dough is. Um, I prepared my ingredients, recipe instructions and filming equipment, which included my work cell phone and a simple tripod and began to film the first video in my series, not done yet, old recipes, new bakers. <laughs> so a little pun there. Um, as a museum educator, teaching is one skill, but filming is an entirely different uh, category. And at first with my videos, I was compared to the Big Bang Theory and Sheldon's fun with flags, if you're familiar with that. Um, but through trial and error, I worked past that somewhat. I continued trying out various recipes and making several videos, um, which included some of the recipes you could see there. So here's some stills from some of those. And of course I tried every recipe that I tasted, every recipe I tried. Um, after the soft ginger cookies, which did turn out pretty well, I tried hominy bread, which was actually pretty good. Um, and this recipe was not too hard to follow. Uh, then I tried my hand at my first failure, which is Parker House Rolls. I have since attempted this a second time and still failed. And the challenge is to Kathy maybe to try and see if she can get it to work. Um, I don't know what, you know, the problem is. It involves two days, as you can see here. You have to make the, um, or prepare your ingredients at 10 p.m. at night, put it in a cool place, mix them at 10 a.m. the next morning, and then put them back in a cool place to knead and uh, cut the rolls and bake at four. So multiple steps, different types of yeast. I couldn't get my dough to rise. And what's supposed to be buttery, delicious rolls turned out to be these flat tacos that you see here. So <laughs> didn't quite work. We'll keep trying uh, maybe again to, to see if that works. Um, after this, I decided to treat myself to one of my most delicious tried recipes, caramel cake, which this one was by far my favorite. Um, not too, again, too hard to figure out missing parts. And kind of how I did that is Google searching recipes today to oh. fill in any gaps and compare. Yeah, fine. Um, and here you can see the caramel cake in progress. So very delicious, um, kind of tasted like a candy we all know in the end. So all of these videos were later added to the Dunn Museum's new YouTube channel. And you can check these out too later if you would like to see how they worked out. And in the notes for each video, we have transcribed uh, the recipe and included that, as well as any notes that I have about what I did to make it work, including baking times and temperatures, um, level amounts of ingredients that weren't specified, um, things like that. So, and of course this cookbook presents a lot of different challenges and I'll go through some of those here in a minute. Um, so with these, I'm not new to baking and I definitely enjoy my baking shows, but I am a novice at historic baking and trying to read handwritten recipes is one thing, but then to try to fill in missing pieces to adapt recipes from the late 1800s to today is a whole other thing. And that is where Kathy came in. Um, and I contacted Kathy to see if she would like to collaborate on program series utilizing the cookbook. And I was aware of her expertise and her cookbook clubs and thought it would be a wonderful collaboration. And we had our first virtual program in July of last year, and then a second one in December um, of last year. So in this program, we tested out recipes and discussed our successes, failures, questions. We invited participants to do the same. So far, we've had no volunteers on that end, <laughs> um, and it wasn't required to participate. 
for the first one, I discussed the recipes I just mentioned, and then we tested some additional recipes second round. Um, one of those, uh, one of my favorites from those that I made was um, scotch cakes. And that actually was um, a cookie that kind of is like shortbread, but with ginger in it. And it was really good. Um, so the Dunn Museum actually has two crofting cookbooks in our collection, and I've now begun uh, examining a second one. Um, here are some of the recipes Kathy tried for us over time, stuffed eggs, federal cake. She was more ambitious in that she approached the egg recipes, and I kind of stayed away from some of those, um, or tried not maybe to test ones that involved a dozen eggs though she did tip me off that cutting the recipe in half to test it is a lot better approach too. Um, she did a snow pudding and cornmeal gems. So here you can see the second cookbook in our collection. So this is actually um, Mary Ethel's mother's cookbook, Gabrielle Josephine Schubert Crofton. And this in the cover page states, Gabrielle J.S. Crofton, Fort Buford, Dakota, May 2nd of 1887. And the cookbook contains many more recipes in what appear to be various handwriting and sections that are mixed together from different cookbooks or sets of papers or notebooks. It even has newspaper clippings inserted or glued in. And here on the um, right page to the left is actually one that spells out more exact measurements for recipes like some of my favorites from the cookbook um, where they quote, butter the size of an egg. So, you know, can measure those or a teacup of yeast. That was a good one too. Um, and this one seems more like a working recipe book with tons of recipes acquired and thrown in as well as stains on the pages, perhaps from use. And though she marked it 1887 on one page, there are recipes that are noted as being older. Like here, you can see um, under the fort 1871. And additional forts are also noted, providing a view into their life as a traveling military family, perhaps sharing recipes directly with women and families while stationed at each location or passed among women and family as they moved and interacted. And in working to compare the recipes included, there are many similar ones to Mary's cookbook, including the recipe for caramel cake, which is the same. Um, and the handwriting in Gabrielle's uh, seems to match the cover page where she notes her name. So I believe she wrote that one. Um, so trying to compare handwriting here too. Um, there's also a recipe in um, Gabrielle's for Parker House Rolls. It is the same exact recipe though, so that didn't help me at all with my nemesis. Um, but it appears that Mary was actually going through her mother's cookbook and selecting recipes for her own, as many are matching so far. And we'll see as I continue to now compare the two. This research though is ongoing, so you could say I'm not done yet. Um, as I'm also now in touch with staff at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware, which has letters and diaries from members of the Crofton family in their collections including diaries from Gabrielle Crofton, the second youngest daughter, who may have been the oldest daughter at Fort Sheridan after their mother passed and whose diary could provide insight into their lives there. Um, we're also currently in touch with descendants of Mary Ethel to get more information on these cookbooks and the family. And this type of work with our collection showcases how items can be used in unique ways to better connect with audiences. Here we began by utilizing the cookbook in the way it was intended as a cookbook. And through that work of examining the recipes and delving into Mary and her family, we're able to tell a more complete, unique story related to Fort Sheridan. That of the family stationed there, the women at the site, and the early years of the establishment of the fort. Fort Sheridan's history covers a large time span and thus a complex array of people and events. And we often tell the larger, more um, of a highlight tour and story, but with this cookbook and the Croftons, we we're able to hone in and really examine more fully life for a family at the fort at that moment in time. By starting with trying out my hand at baking from this historic cookbook, it's now opened up new connections and questions that I'm continuing to pursue and research, such as connections with the family again and other museums. 
And this one family also connects so many stories of the Chicago area into one family's experiences and highlights life for often underrepresented groups, that of women and perhaps military families of that time period. The recipes themselves provide insight into family or personal cookbooks and ingredients and cooking methods at that time period. And preserving this knowledge that may have been lost otherwise, as many historic recipes are not recorded, as the cook often uh, you know, knew them by memory, and often only recipes made occasionally or for special occasions would be written down, or parts of the recipe that needed to be re remembered and not the whole thing. Cookbooks, especially handwritten ones like these, are very personal items and important in showcasing family traditions, family history, and providing a more in-depth look at daily life. Food and recipes unite us in so many ways, and people connect certain foods or recipes with fond memories of childhood, important individuals in their lives who cooked these recipes, social events and functions, and more. And this then is another way to make history, our collections and our research more relevant to our audiences like you, and we get the benefit of continuing to expand our skills and our taste buds in the process. So. So thank you, Nicole. It's always good to share um, a presentation with a fellow University of Michigan graduate. So that's very fun for me. Um, I'm giving a very abbreviated um, presentation of what I presented in, in um, Springfield this fall about women philanthropy recipes and social progress because we really want we want to get to the cookbooks tonight. Um, so as Professor Catherine Maloney pointed out, as scholarly information resources, cookbooks are versatile, multifaceted, and approachable, and they provide links. We can see the link with Fort Sheridan with Nicole, and with Kathy, we're going to see the link with these women club, women's clubs in Highland Park, and a very young community at the time. So we're going to begin. It's the 19th century. Native Americans have been removed in 1833. We have this glaciated landscape, a beautiful beach. And um, in 2013, when assisting a researcher planning a centennial celebration, having his ties to the Illinois Suffrage Act of 1913 of the Ravinia Village House, it became clear to me this club that coming up and I didn't know have the records for, the Soli Club was more than just an auxiliary club of the Highland Park Club. We have the records at the Highland Park Historical Society, now part of the Highland Park Archives and Local History Collections, of all three women's clubs, Highland Park, Ravinia, and Asoli, they are all digitized. They're all available on the Digital Library of America and the Illinois Digital Archive. But we didn't at the time, I hadn't found the Asoli Club records. Um, however, um, when we moved to the library with the archives, I found them hidden away and it was the greatest archival find, find I think that I've had. Um, but food habits. So, Kathy's going to be talking about two cookbooks, one by the Asoli Club and one by the Highland Park Club. And um, the Asoli Club had its cookbook. And most of these community cookbooks, not, if not all, were created to raise funds and to for causes, religious, charity, and they have their roots in the Civil War Sanitary Commission. So the Asoli Club of Highland Park noted that there was no public beach at the time. And this is just after. The Soli Club is founded in 1894. In 1911, they begin their beach. The Park District of Highland Court lo launched in 1909, but they were just developing. So the woman had this beautiful beach and they funded it and they manned it. We had lifeguards and um, the Soli Club was kind of a rebellion in that um, they named themselves after Margaret Fuller a Soli. We'll go more about that later. So the woman started this club at the Highland Park Club, which makes it not the first standalone women's club because they were part of another club and they closed after 1930, after the Highland Park Club itself closed. But they created the cookbook that Kathy's gonna talk about to raise funds for the beach, for apparata, for paying the best or something. So they got swimming lessons. And that was quite a successful endeavor. In fact, the book was still being sold and being requested in 1920. And um, the, the money required to maintain the beach went up over the years. 
And there were times when the beach was in doubt and eventually the beach evolved to the city, to the park district, to a public beach. But in the interim, it was managed by these women and um, very successful endeavor. Now, the Highland Park Club was founded in 1899 and they um, were the first standalone independent women's club. You can see they started in 1899 they had their cookbook, they created their cookbook to raise funds so they could have their own clubhouse, which they achieved um, within a year, and it was started building in 1926. And so I'm going to pass this over to Kathy so she can talk about the cookbooks. And if anyone is interested, we do have recorded the full presentation about these very important clubs to Highland Park. Thank you, Kathy. You know, I wanted to introduce Kathy, which oh. is very, very, I'm sorry, Kathy, for being so rude. Oh, that's okay. Catherine Lambrecht is, really doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to introduce her nevertheless. In addition to being the volunteer program director for the Highland Park Historical Society, she is a vanguard culinary historian, leading documentation and educational efforts, including with the Midwest Foodways, the Culinary Historians of Chicago, Chicago Foodways Roundtable. Kathy is also involved in mycology, another vanguard. So if you missed it, in August 23rd, 2020, the Guardian newspaper declared that the future is fungal. And Kathy, not talking about that, she's talking about cookbooks today. So we'll do that now. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, you're very welcome. Let me so in, in going over so quickly over the presentation, I didn't talk about Margaret Fuller O'Sully, who was in fact a well-known transcendentalist polymath of the 19th century. And it was kind of a secret code among 19th century women because she was very well read call themselves a Soli Club to show their independence. So that's where the name Soli Club comes from. But oh. we, one thing we do, there was a lot of crossover membership with women that were, because to be a part of the Soli Club, oh. your family had to belong to the Highland Park Club. And so the Highland Park Women's Club was standing alone and anyone in theory could join. And that was their, their quest to involve women from across society, come across the city. And so, but Kathy did do a comparison of the contributors to these two cookbooks and the Highland Park Women's Club and Solo Club, as much as they had the matching, and the Ravinia Women's Club too, which merged in 1968 with the Highland Park Club, it had very similar memberships. They had very different contributors to their cookbooks for two different goals. And in fact, mm -hmm. we have the public beach still, we also have the community house, which was the clubhouse that the cookbook built. Oh. And all of these, 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 these women, they're really developing okay. their roles in the public sphere. So when we did this presentation and when we made the proposal to the um, Illinois History Conference, it was about the Asoli cookbook solely. Not, that wasn't intended to be a pun, but I guess I just made it one. It was, but the week before the, the presentation, Nancy sends me a note and says, by the way, we just located the Highland Park Women's Club cookbook from 1925. I'm like, oh boy, because these two are, as she pointed out, are interconnected. You can be, you can't be in a solely club member without being a Highland Park Women's Club member, but you can be a Highland Park Women's Club member and not be in a solely club member. So these two really are intertwined and very much touching the same population. And I kind of thought about it for a day. And then I brought myself over to the library and I scanned this book. Um, and it didn't take very long. It's very fragile. I don't think there's gonna be too many opportunities for that book to be touched. Cause it's just, it really, but if it hadn't been stitched together, it would have been a disaster, but fortunately it was stitched together. But these community cookbooks, the, the whole sense of community cookbooks began in the 19, um, in, in the, it's during the civil war and they were fundraisers. These books were sold to earn money so that they could go and raise enough money to buy bandage material, roll it up and send it to the front. And there was a purpose and a function. And in many of these uh, community cookbooks, there usually is some fundraising intent involved. So in this case, uh, with the Usoli Club, it was to fund this beach project. For the Highland Park Historical, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Highland Park Women's Club, it was to fund 
this building, um, their, their club, which is now um, part of the city of Highland Park. It's the community um, center. Very lovely. And when we've had teas, they were located at this building. But the Highland Park Women's Club has also done some deeper things like, and I, and I, for instance, um, they badgered a Mr. Carnegie for funds to build a library. And he didn't really want to give the, the people in Highland Park. He kept coming up with conditions and they kept meeting the conditions. And eventually they ran out of conditions and he agreed to fund the library. And this library uh, existed in Highland Park until the early 1930s when it was uh, demolished. And then the one that we have today at the same location. There's one other Carnegie Library in, um, in Lake County, and that's up in Waukegan. Um, it's uh, Ray Bradbury spent a lot of time at this particular library in Waukegan. And they just, the uh, Waukegan Historical Society and the Waukegan Park District have now acquired that building and they're going to be um, renovating it. And hopefully it will also include a uh, room dedicated to Ray Bradbury. But anyway, that's an aside. Um, these books were not indexed like this suggests, these are more like chapter headings. Um, I did have to create an index for both books to be able to do workable things with it. And I'll show you uh, how I outlined it later. Um, but this was, this was ex what you see is what you get. And at least in the newer book, the 1925 book, a chapter broke, it was a fresh page and it went on to the next page. The, a solely cookbook, one thing just blended into another, um, which made it particularly, and there's an army of contributors, by the way. The a solely cookbook had 653 recipes. It had 130 contributors. The, um, the Highland Park Women's Club had 184 contributors. It only had 445 recipes. But one of the differences also between the two books was, um, and by the way, here's the prolific contributors. And you can tell with the Asoli cookbook, this Mrs. E.B. Pierce, it wouldn't surprise me if she's on the organizing committee because when you're, when you're in that kind of a role and you don't have enough recipes, you start digging through your own personal collection. And she did with 28 recipes. Um, and these were you know, some of the ones with the Highland Park Women's Club you know, one person gave 10 recipes. Now you see Detroit, that's Detroit, Michigan, but there's also recipes attributed to Kentucky, Michigan, California, and the United Kingdom. So apparently if you went traveling and you got a recipe from a region, you just simply gave the region's name for attribution, which by the way, um, in the Asoli Cookbook Club, there was one woman who contributed, I think like about, six, seven recipes. She always gave attribution to other people, not herself for those recipes. Everybody else gave attributions to themselves, whether or not it was from them. Well, who knows? And there might have, but I suspect not, one male contributor, Granville Mott. I think that was in the Highland Park, uh, or maybe, well, it doesn't matter, but I have a feeling they forgot to say Mrs. Granville Mott. But in the Asoli Club cookbook, there were 250 recipes without any known contributors. And to both cookbooks, and you know, these are closely associated organizations, there were only three overlapping contributors. And we'll see. And probably this is an advertisement that was in the 1925 book. I will suspect quite easily that this was likely the printer of the book. There is no known attribution for the printer for the, um, for, you know, who printed the book. And both of them were all kind of, I would say, um, effectively self-published. Um, now here on the left, you have something, we have a, a, a representation of cornbread recipes. There were at least probably 14 or so cornbread recipes. In the newer book, the 1925 book, if several people contributed, let's say the same recipe, 
they didn't print that recipe and give a name three different times, which sort of happened in the um, Asoli cookbook. They just gave three different authors for the same recipe, which is rather nice. And you can see it's a little bit more stylish, the representation on the right side. Uh, you know, cornbread by Mrs. Hussey is a recitation of recipes and baked 20 minutes, but it's up to you to figure out the, the oven temperature. Um, in a few cases, you got like detailed instructions, and I suspect they came out of some book somewhere. I don't know if it could have been like the settlement house, could have been Fanny Farmer, who knows what it was. But now you see in the, on the right, you see graham gems, you see good breakfast gems, you see rice gems. And the first time I encountered all these gems was uh, working with Nicole on the Fort Sheridan manuscript cookbook. And I was like, what's with all these gems and why such a varied recipe? Well, gem company is the manufacturer of these metal molds. And so all these references to gem had to do with these molds. Because um, they're quite, it's quite diverse, all these recipes, and for no particular uh, reason. Now, in the Asoli cookbook, the, the 1911 book, they at least gave you some reference of how to cook and measure things, but just some. And um, I guess that's better than nothing, right? Um, and some things, you know, like measurements, two cups of butter packed solidly equals one pound. Yeah, that's about right. Um, but they also had a measurement for eggs where I tried it with regular large eggs and it didn't quite square, but what else is new? Now, one of the issues with these cookbooks where you run into, like if you're just going to cook, you know, make the stew, make the soup, make, uh, you know, that kind of, a rat, you know, that cooking, you're, you're gonna, these books are quite, you are quite useful and you can, you can figure out what to do. Where you can run into trouble is with baking. Um, in, in, the, in these books, baking soda was often referenced just as soda. Um, baking powder, this is where the fun begins. And in fact, the University of Illinois Press has a book called Baking Powder Wars, all related to this issue. Now we have, uh, for instance, baking powders that would be available for instance would be like Dr. Price's cream baking powder. Um, Dr. Price happened to live in Waukegan. And he, by the way, he also had a grandson named Vincent. And probably you've seen him in a few movies. Uh, there's Royal Baking Powder. And one of the things that was kind of interesting about this situation was they, a lot of these um, baking powder manufacturers had booklets that were specific to their um, product. So if you took a Dr. Price recipe and used royal baking powder, the recipe likely won't work and vice versa. Um, they were so specific that, you know, even, even the uh, early versions of the Joy of Cooking had sometimes some adaptions for if it was single or double uh, action um, or double um, baking powder. You know, just because you don't know quite what, you, you know, adapted for those situations. Now, quite often it was sort of the do it yourself in the sense that baking powder is effect effectively, you know, baking, baking soda and cream of tartar. But, um, but some of these double acting ones, they have one where it rises also a little bit depending on the temperature of the product. They might use, uh, or instead of cream of tartar, they might use sour milk, they use, or, or buttermilk. Now, buttermilk in that era was not the buttermilk that we buy today. The buttermilk we get today is a, is a, a cultured product. Buttermilk back then was that thin liquid that was left after you took the butter, you know, the, took, took the fats out to make butter. So that was your buttermilk. Yeast was also a little bit of a puzzle and, and, and it's going to add a little bit more. Uh, so there was cake yeast, there was yeast powder, there was a teacup of yeast, which was what Nicole encountered in her recipe. And 
at a recent visit to the Buffalo, uh, the, the um, Ralph Museum in Buffalo Grove, I learned when they had, uh, there's a, a, sh uh, a grocery store from about a hundred years ago and they have some of the receipts from the customers and they have something they called frothy yeast, frothy yeast, just to add to the complications. And yes, someday I will take up the challenge to do those, excuse me, those Parker House rolls. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> it's gonna take a bit of an effort. Um, but I also, by the way, made a point of preparing some of the recipes in these books. Now here's spaghetti and cheese. To me, the, 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 the uh, instruction that stood out boldly in my head was uh, boil constantly for 30 minutes the, the, the spaghetti or the pasta or whatever you're using. In this case, I used elbows. And I just had to know what happens when you boil pasta for 30 minutes. So I got that thing to a rolling boil. I hit the timer and I left the room because I didn't want to even remotely consider um, rescuing this. And what I found was it reached a saturation point, the macaronis, they got bigger and bigger and bigger and they just basically stopped and just stayed as big as they could be for that, that period of time. Um, but of course, this recipe is rescued by, you know, you drain it. In this case, they say drain and bleach in cold water. Well, you know, they meant drain and blanch. But by putting it into a casserole and putting in lots of cheese and baking it off for a while, you know, what may have worked out might have been a little bit wobbly, uh, worked out well in the end. Um, but in any case, um, you know, it, it, was, it was an okay meal. We, we ate it for lunch one day. Um, they also had these, there was a trend for salads on a crisp lettuce leaf. And they also had in some cases an alternative and that wasn't just a crisp lettuce leaf, but to make a kind of like a, a half cup, like with a um, green pepper and fill it with what have you. Um, but in this case, I tried to make the pond lilies and I tried to kind of like arrange it decoratively and I tried it several different ways. Uh, probably the one on top is the least clumsy, but you know, I will not get points for being a stylist. Let's put it that way. And mayonnaise, often, often with these recipes where you were assembling things on that crisp lettuce leaf, you were putting French dressing on top or you would put mayonnaise, which in the 1911 book was always with a capital M, not so much in the book from 1925. Um, Mrs. Millard was one of those people who had uh, contributions in both books. She had an X next to this book in the Asoli. Whoever owned that particular copy had put an X by the German coffee cake. Um, I thought it meant that maybe it was a recipe she didn't particularly like. Uh, somebody said that they put, I talked later and somebody said, oh, but I put X's next to things that I want to make again. So I have no idea, but I did um, make it for, you know, a post, post lunch sweet one day. I don't remember if I put two teaspoons of baking powder in there or not, or did I go and look for a parallel recipe and figure I needed a, only a teaspoon, but I made it, put the cinnamon and sugar on top. It was it was delicious. It was, you know, on the simple side, but you know, it, it worked and that's all that matters. Um, of course, we have to have the people who are concerned about your health. And so in this case, we had the shredded wheat biscuit. Um, unfortunately, I can't read the thing. I have a bar in front of it, but this would make it, it was gonna be more delicate and digestible than bread dressing. And I did, take a shot at this. I made a half recipe. And instead of using the large shredded wheats, I used the mini shredded wheats. Um, it was fine. Um, it's not exactly my favorite. And actually in the, the book from 1925, 
they had exactly one recipe with shredded wheat and that one had the crumbs of shredded wheat. So they're being thrifty and making sure you use whatever's sitting at the bottom of the box. Um, um, and this was baked eggplant. This was from Mrs. Pierce who had contributed quite a lot to the, um, uh, to the book. She was the one that had pulled out and looked like, you know, put in recipes for her personal collection to kind of bulk up the Asoli cookbook. And this one was, you know, you, you boiled an eggplant, you skinned it, you mashed it, you know, you layered it with green peppers and all sorts of things. I, oh, and then you poured milk on top and baked it off. Um, you know, we had it for lunch, it was fine. Uh, you know, I wasn't very excited about it, but at the same time, it wasn't awful. And uh, we got to try it. It kind of fell into the category of foods that I would refer to, to be very polite and nice as exotic. You know, like, yeah, I tried it. It was quite exotic. Doesn't mean I'll do it again, but at least I didn't say anything negative either. There was really nothing negative about it. It was just, in fact, my reaction, my dad's reaction, because I served this eggplant, I served the uh, shredded wheat stuffing at the same lunch. And my dad said, this is not lunch. This is your cooking experiments, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's true. Um, now in the 1925 book, we had chop suey and muck chop suey. And in the chop suey recipe, they had brown three tablespoons of sugar in spider until it scorches and pour hot water over it. Well, you know, I think at this point they were trying to replicate at least the color that comes from soy sauce without having access to soy sauce. And of course, there's a, a, a use of celery. Um, and in fact, I make for my fit, we did a program on um, Chinese food a few years ago with uh, Louisa Chu and uh, Monica Eng. And I, I know that Louise is very partial to chop suey. So I made a chop suey for them and it had, you know, well, it had at least a pound of celery and there's quite a bit of celery in this recipe. The arroz con pollo kind of comes across, I mean, it's quite not an unreasonable recipe. The thing is at the very end, it says serve on toast will serve 25. I'm not, well, serve on toast is certainly something we would never dream of with the arroz con pollo. But uh, serve 25, well, I guess they went after smaller portions than we do presently. Um, the fried chicken, this recipe to me was just a riot because this person is um, adjusting the, 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 you know, put the skillet on the back of the stove or on a glass plate with a, you know, with a low, um, with a low flame. And you can tell that getting a low flame for her is a bit of a challenge. And in the end, she'd rather you know, throw up her hands and, and have an old fashioned kitchen stove. And it kind of reminded me, you could just feel her frustration. You know, all these new things, but I prefer my, you know, my wood fired stove. Well, my father visited my great grandmother in Ireland in 1958. The woman had a hearth and she had a wood fired stove. The wood fired stove was pretty much untouched and she continued to work with her heart. Um, also in the 1925 book and something I don't think you see very often in any community cookbook was what to do with leftovers. Um, I don't really see it. More often I see what I would call, you know, the fancy dishes, the desserts, the, you know, the, the, the company dishes and even what I would say aspirational dishes, things that I would like you to think come out of my kitchen. And yes, I would like that, but it has not yet happened. Um, nothing soup, you know, any piece of meat, vegetables, all sorts, thyme and other condiments that are handy. Yeah, cook it for a long time, it tastes delicious. It's basically reworking your leftovers. And the squirrel pot pie, this was the only one of the two books that had, I would say, a uh, game in it. Um, now I met somebody where she, her, one of the older community cookbooks in her town, well, she's out in a, in a more rural community 
and she was wondering if we had any hunters here. And we do, but I think not quite at that level. And this um, recipe for lemon cups, the only reason I highlight it is because it refers to, you know, something that it could be a transportable food for motorists. It was the only recipe in the 1925 book that even referenced motorists, but that's special on, on its own. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, well, well, here, I guess what I should do. So this is, this is the kind of index that I wrote. So on the left, it says page two. It gave what the chapter was, what the recipe name was, who the author was, and in the order. And this is exactly in the order that the, it was in the book. So later on, if I wanted to recreate it, I could, because later on, once, once it gets all messed up, forget it. Um, ingredients, and especially if they named ingredients, like here we have a jerky salad dressing um, or the uh, Snyder's oyster cocktail sauce. I think this is the um, 1925 book. Some of the processes I highlighted, um, I processed, you know, anything that kind of struck me as being interesting, I highlighted. Um, but there were other things that were in this book, like ketchup ketchup was not that red thing you reliably you know pulled out of a jar and shook down it could have been made from um tomatoes mushrooms walnuts i know on my own but unrelated to these books i've made grape ketchup and the very first actually culinary historians meeting that i ever attended was september 1995 and it was andy smith talking about ketchup and there he said the reason why there's two spellings for ketchup, the C-A-T-S-U-P and the K-E-T-C-H-U-P is because it's a transliteration of a Chinese word for fish sauce. All about that. Um, there was a lot of references to food choppers and double boilers. And I suspect I, I, I have owned and have gotten rid of double boilers. I can improvise one anytime. We know that. But Back then, I think a double boiler was especially important because they really had a hard time with uh, control of the heat. So you had to kind of, kind of moderate the temperatures on your, you know, using the double boiler. There wasn't too many other opportunities. Now, and I know Penelope, this is for you in a sense, but in the 1912 cookbook, there were 25 recipes for using cream sauces and these cream and well some of the criticism sometimes of midwestern food was that everything was bathed in a in a in a blanket of white but in the 1925 book creamed recipes were down to four so you go from 25 to four i think what we're seeing is it's a food trend it's kind of like you know quiche in the 1970s and quiche, you know, in the early 90s, you probably won't see too many in the book from the 90s and a lot in the book from the 1970s. Um, there were also a number of croquettes in the 1912 book. And when I was taking home ec class, I remember croquettes was, you know, you could make the thick sauce for making croquettes was four tablespoons of butter, four tablespoons of flour, and a cup of milk and, you know, of course, some salt. And there, you, I only made a croquette for the first time about a year ago. I was, you know, one of those COVID moments where you're bored and you wanna try something you've never done before. So I made croquettes. Um, one of also the differences between the 1912 and the 1925 book was canned uh, products. We had a war and in between and during the war the war department literally that was the name at the time put out cookbooks for women on how to assemble nutritious tasty meals using canned goods because they didn't they wanted people not to be spending their days go, cooking you know breakfast then cooking lunch cooking dinner they needed them to come out of the home and work on behalf of the war effort. And one of those ways was to reduce the amount of time it took for you to prepare a meal. So in the 1925 book, you start to see Campbell's tomato soup and other products. Um, that was just the situation. 
1912 book, uh, there was lard, suet, butter. There was some, you know, cooking oil, some olive oil. By, by the 1925 book, Crisco, which was at the time anyway, crystallized cottonseed oil. There was also references to shortening and to one reference to butterine, which, um, which was a, a product that was developed apparently in the late, the, the late 1860s. And it was to use all that animal fat you know, beef and pork that was coming through the, um, the stockyards. And I think I've, I've had some buttering and there is, and I know Peter Angler's here tonight. Uh, he's taken a picture of at least one of the ghost um, advertising signs somewhere like west of the loop um, of buttering. Um, cornflakes also popped up in the um, 19, 25 book. So there, you know, there's a transition. Things are going on. In the 1911 book, a lot of the flavorings, when you flavored a dessert, quite often you were just choose whatever flavoring you wish. Well, whatever flavoring you wish at that time, you know, especially depending on the age of the recipes, but orange and rose water, grated nutmeg, you know, these kinds of things were the, the major flavors. There was some vanilla, but by 1925, there was a lot of vanilla being referenced in the recipes. And one of the changes goes back to the 1840s. And there was a 12 year old slave child who came up with the method to hand pollinate vanilla. From, from listening to a, a lecture from Harold McGee there no longer is known what is the insect that naturally pollinates vanilla because they have not been they have not been allowed to to <laughs> naturally pollinate any longer. Um, so so vanilla until let's say like the 1880s was very rare and quite expensive. But you know as as production increased, the the price came down. Um, there was also a lot of, in the 1911 book especially, there was a lot of use of celery. And this was still when celery was the king of vegetables. Uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan is, you know, one of the locations that was the hot spot. There was a lot of flavoring with cayenne and white and black pepper. And often, yeah, cayenne pepper to the extent, and People know me, I'm not very um, enthusiastic about capsation related heat. I think there's some dishes I might actually ratchet back or eliminate the cayenne that was suggested, the quantities anyway. Um, I did see in the 1925 book, something that surprised me. Um, it was Eagle brand, you know, the sweetened condensed milk boiled for a few hours and it would make a suitable dessert for four quite similar to blanc mange. I have never, and that was the first time I have ever heard that recipe referenced to blanc mange. I've always heard it in the South American Mexican context of making dulce de leche, but not blanc mange. This was, this was new. In the 1911 book, there was election cake. And there was federal cake. And this was when women were still um, fighting hard to get the, to the opportunity to vote. 1925 book, both of those recipes are gone, uh, which I thought was quite surprising. Now, as you can see, you've been treated to looking at my, my, my spreadsheet here. But there's another reason why I went into the detail I did, especially like with ingredients and such, was the opportunity to, uh, this is the Sifter project. This is the uh, brainchild of uh, Barbara Ketchum Whedon, who started this project like, I think the early 1960s and collected all this data on older cookbooks and our, you know, as well as community cookbooks and the recipes they had in them and who authored them and where were they printed and how many, um, additions and such. And 
I did add to this the um, information about the Asoli Cookbook Club, as well as the Highland Park Women's Club Cookbook. And at some point, I'm going to go back and start adding the information related to the recipes that are on there. And then if I have enough time and left in my life or somebody will take it over for me, the ingredients that were used, because ultimately this will become a huge database for researchers and you'll be able to figure out when was the first recipe with Crisco. I know that's something people are very worried about, but nonetheless, there's going to be somebody out there that, that thinks about these things. So it's a way to make a contribution. It's a way to give some life to this cookbook. Now, in addition to scanning this cookbook, um, Nancy used uh, optical character recognition software. And I then went and um, edited and corrected all the different any misspellings and what have you. And it's now, you know, and Nancy can tell better, a little bit better where it's located, but it's now usable and siftable for other people. Well, there's another reason to pursue, and I, I'm going to be doing some talks in the next few months to different historical societies. And I'm going to point out to them that, that we, all of these groups have these community cookbooks. But there's a still a connection to the presence. So when I was at the library scanning the books, um, Mary Seafarth came forward and said, Kath, what are you up to? And I said, I'm scanning, cook scanning this cookbook from 1925. And she goes, are there any recipes for my grandmother? I says, I have no idea. But I was there just to do the quick scan and then go home. So I didn't have the time to to leaf through it. But later on, I did. And her grandmother um, had a sort of a short life. She, she was, you know, 1878 to 1928. So she lived about 49, 50 years. But quite a dynamic person from what I can tell. I mean, she was on a school board when she couldn't be elected to be a school board. But she was there and she did a number of other things related to, to education. And after she died, a year after this clock that's in this um, picture um, was dedicated in her honor and, you know, had to be an outstanding person. But I did promise Mary if I found recipes, I would give them to her. And lo and behold, there were five recipes related to her grandmother. Now, of course, you know, they didn't reference her by her name, Nellie Martin Seafarth. She was Mrs. Robert Seafarth, which he happens to be an architect who's done a number of things. And Mary's done a good job of keeping her grandfather's name front and forward. He did a good job, so it's worth it. But nonetheless, these recipes existed. And I was so thrilled to share that with her. And it also gave it more relevance because in that large list of volunteers that contributed recipes, there were other names that are still known in my community. Are they related? I don't know, but you know, that's something somebody can do a comparative of. Um, so this concludes my discussion. Uh, we can take questions in the chat um, and go from there. But this was terribly worthwhile. And like I said, totally, Nancy inspired because I I have so many things to do. I don't need another um, activity, but this has been great fun and I've learned a lot. So um, let's see, what do we have in the chat? Or did anybody have an opportunity to look at it yet? Um, oh, somebody's having a Lake Effect Super Shake Barrel Age Chocolate Mount Stud or Stout, wow. I added something. Ah, so perhaps the frothy yeast. That's very funny. Um, who knew Vincent Price had a Waukegan grandma? Well, in this case, grandpa. Oh, and a grandma, yes. His whole persona was that scary guy with the cape. Vincent Price once sold Johnny, once told Johnny Carson that in real life he was a pussycat. By the way, his grandfather's home is still um up in Waukegan 
It's on Grand Avenue. I don't know the address offhand, but I'm sure it can be located. And there was a Price relative who lived in Highland Park. Um, I know it's a that, synagogue uh, now. Huh? It's a synagogue now, I believe. It, is the building gone, or it was it transformed into a synagogue? Let me check. Uh -huh. Okay, so Desiree's talked about dried celery, and oh, Townsend's. That's actually one of my favorite shirts to wear when I'm doing talks. I have a Townsend shirt, making mushroom ketchup. Oh yeah, that was, stuff was real. Highland Park hunting applications. I don't know what that's about. Um, oh, you said you didn't know people hunted in Highland Park, but I put that in there because people got hunting like people did hunt in Highland Park at that time. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, <laughs> never mind. I, there's more contemporary things. There was one time about a whole thing about you know, off year elections don't bring too many people to the polls. One year, one of the poll, one of the uh, issues was related to whether or not we um, call to, you know, call to, what do you say, call the deer or just keep them. Oh. So it, Beth L. Synagogue, the Price Mansion is still there, as far as I know. Oh, then we'll have to go look. I didn't know, that's cool. Um, Penelope loves her double boilers and use them all the time for oatmeal, thawing, heating, frozen homemade soup, more. No worries about burning. I like yeah. my double boiler too. You do too? Okay, well, yeah. there I am. I make a comment. It is kind of old fashioned, but it, it, it works, especially if you're busy. You right. have to no, watch I, it. I, I sure, I'm sure it does. I just, uh, do you use a microwave? I see one in behind you, but I don't know if you use it. I, I, I use it sometimes, mostly to warm things up, like coffee. Oh, okay, so you gave the prof, okay, good. I think Kalamazoo used to host the college football celery bowl. How polite. Oh, I don't know. You don't know? I don't She's, think so. Nancy's from Michigan, so is Nicole. Steve just said something, but I don't know what it was. Oh, okay. Oh, somebody wants to know, Nicole, about that handsome man on your bookcase behind you. Oh, yeah, that is my grandfather. So I am broadcasting from uh, my home and not the museum, I think somebody asked. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Mary C. Fark tells me that the Highland Park Women's Club cookbook also has a recipe for my grandmother, Mrs. Carl Bingham. <laughs> Didn't know she cooked. Very funny. Well, I think if there's no more questions, are we about to- Do you see a question about the cookbooks? So um, this the only cookbook, we don't have a copy, unfortunately, um, in Highland Park, but there is a copy online at the University of Illinois. It's also available via the Internet Archive. The Highland Park Women's Club cookbook is available via um, the Illinois Digital Archive, as are many of the Fort Sheridan images from Dunn and from the Highland Park collections as well. Hey, Nicole, somebody wanted to know where the Dunn Museum is located. Sure. So uh, the Dunn Museum, we used to be the Lake County Discovery Museum in Wakanda, if you had visited that site before in the Lakewood Forest Preserve. We closed our doors there in 2016 and moved to Libertyville and we're in the general offices for the Lake County Forest Preserves. So we're off Winchester Road between Butterfield and Route 45. And we renamed ourselves the Dunn Museum after our county's first historian, Bess Bauer Dunn. So um, you can find more information too, I'll put in the chat on upcoming programs and our address and everything. Um, I'll put in again how to visit. The Dunn Museum is open right now, so you are able to come and uh, I'll put in the chat our current hours so you can see that too. Do you have to make a reservation? Currently, no. You can come just anytime while we're open um, during the week. So currently we're open Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So it looks like Steve was third? serious about the salary bowl. So. <laughs> And the first two. and third um, Thursday, isn't that the USG supported free day? 
Yes, every first and third Thursday of the month. Uh, the Dunn Museum is typically open late uh, for free for visitors to come. And we typically have a program attached to that. Uh, right now, it could be a virtual program or an in-person um, coming up. So you can check out those on our website there too. And I'm going to put our how to visit in the chat here. And by the way, uh, next Thursday, in the fall, in the immediate following Saturday, so it's like about the 20th or the 22nd, is mm -hmm. the Lake County History Symposium. And uh, Nancy will have something there on Saturday related to the Daughters of the American Revolution in the late 19th and early 20th century um, did a photographic survey of the log cabin structures that still remained, which is really phenomenal that they did that. And we're going to have an exhibit about it in the Stubby Gardens in be, between the City Hall and the library in the spring. Right. And then um, one of our board members, uh, Jeff Stern, is going to do an interesting, I would say a micro study on assumed information that everybody accepts as correct turned out to be wrong. And, and it just kept getting repeated and repeated. And it has to do with uh, the inventor, Elijah Gray. So lots of things to look forward to. Yes, Andrew Smith's book on ketchup. I have that book and that was the first meeting I went to for culinary historians years ago. Laughed myself silly driving into the city for a lecture on ketchup, but I loved it. And I've been there for what, 27 years later. So there you go. Are we all done ladies? Do we have any, any choice comments we need to make? I'm good. <laughs> if anyone needs questions, just email me at the Historical Society of the Library and I will answer them to my and best it's ability. like what? Archives at highlandparkhistory.org. I'll put that in the chat. Okay. And I All did right. put um, links to visiting the Dunn Museum, upcoming programs with the Lake County Forest Preserves, and our YouTube channel if you want to check out the playlist for the Not Done Yet videos. And Perhaps we'll add to some of those in the future. Um, you can also look for if we have any more of those uh, virtual programs coming up. And if Kathy Masters Parker House rolls better than me someday. <laughs> yep. And if you guys want to keep some of that information that's sitting in the chat, where the little chat box is, there's like these three little dots. And if you click on them, it will allow you to save it onto your hard drive. Um, but nice seeing you all. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to go have some dinner. <laughs> Bye, everybody.